Hello, everyone. While we open up in prayer, this morning, I'd like us to um, pray for the first responders. We have a, a few of them that attend church here. But there are many of them out there on the front lines, and some of them are contacting, um, contracting the, the virus. So we want to just lift them up. Father, we just pray right now as we open up this morning. We just pray right now in Jesus' name for your holy presence that your will be done. And we pray right now, Lord, for these first responders. We just lift them up that you would protect them and watch over them as you bring them through as a minister, the police officers, the EMT workers, the firemen, those respiratory workers, those nurses on the front lines. We just lift them up and those doctors. And we just pray protection on them. And if they don't know you, Lord, I just pray that you just draw them near to you. And we give you the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you about something that Jesus said in Luke chapter 19. And the title of the message is, Occupy Till I Come. And I want to bring forth an, an understanding this morning about why we're here. You know, after the Lord saves our souls, that should be first priority to get right with Christ. Definitely with God the Father and be in right standings and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But after that happens, we're still alive. We're here. What's, what's God's purpose? What is he saying to us today? Well, one of the things in one of the scriptures, it says, occupy till I come. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be living among the people and yet showing them how to live in Christ. That means to work alongside them, to go to the stores uh, times we might need to be in the hospital, at times we, when we're on vacation or wherever we go and whatever we do, we're supposed to be demonstrating to this world how to live for Christ in the midst of this world. So let's look at the scripture here. It's in Luke 19 and it says, And he said, and he said Therefore a certain normal man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants, and he delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. It's an interesting story here, and it's a parable, and the Lord's talking about himself here. He's talking about how he came to this earth, and then now he, he's up in heaven right now. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's, he's attaining to his kingdom. He's sitting upon the throne. He is King Jesus right now. And we need to demonstrate who he is to this world and how he is in heaven. And he's coming back. And the, the story goes on to say how God gave 10, 10 pounds to each one of his servants. And, and, it, and it goes on to say that they one, one of them turned it into 10 more, one turned it into 5 more. There was one that hid it. And there were some wicked people in the story that didn't want him to rule. And that's those, that's those people in, in Israel that rejected him, the high priests and the Pharisees and Sadducees, but not all of them, but that was the large group. That's the government of Israel that had rejected Jesus Christ, and they don't want him. They didn't want him to rule over them. But then he comes back, and at the end of the story, you see where he destroys these wicked ones, and then he gives cities to the faithful ones. He gives ten cities to one, five to the other. It doesn't say about all ten of them. One of them is, is cast out because he, he buries his talents and his gifts. But we need to understand what's being said here. When we go on, go to the next slide, please. And out of 59 English translations, the word occupy means to do business. And that's the, about 28 of them say do business. And the other one says to trade and do different things with the money that was given. And the Lord expects us to, to take the talents and gifts. You see, uh, we're going to find out in just a minute. You go ahead and go to it. If Jesus didn't give us money to invest, he has given us great and precious promises. He's given us these promises, and he's given us gifts and talents and abilities. And this is what he expects us to use for him, to demonstrate, to show. It's in our lives and our witness. In Acts chapter 1, the Lord told the disciples and 400 people, he said, he said, um, go and wait, and 120 went into the upper room, and he told them to wait on the promise of the Father so that the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon us so that we might be witnesses in this world. 
And that's the and that's the whole idea. And that's what the promises and the gifts are all about. Is to be a witness to this world on how to live for Jesus. How do we live for Jesus in the midst of a of a virus? I found out last night that right now, since the beginning of this year, 22,000 people have died of the regular flu. This is something a statistic you don't hear about. But this is something I looked up on YouTube, and, and this man looked it up and, and uh, found out that right now, 27,000 thousand people have already died of the flu. That's, that's incredible. People are dying all the time in automobile accidents and, and wars and pestilence all over the place and terrible things are happening all around us. And now we have this virus and the whole world is focused on it. But you know, there's something that we need to, we need to understand as a Christian that God has left us after our salvation to live here on this earth to occupy, to do business, to go and invest the gifts that God has given us into somebody else's life. When you hear someone talking about fear, there's a time for us to step up and say, you know, the Lord is with us. The Lord will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He promised to be with us throughout this whole ordeal. So in every situation we find ourselves, God wants us to, to glorify him by having a smile on our face to show that we're not afraid that we walk before the Lord. You know, if I see anything in this virus, I see an awakening. There's a lot of prophets out there saying all kinds of different things. Some of them are saying this thing's going to be over with by Easter. We got the, the world saying it could go on. This month coming is going to be worse than March. May is going to be worse than, than April. And this is a scary thing to this world. But these prophets are saying by Easter time, this thing's going to disappear. As fast as it came in, it's going to go out. I'm not a prophet. I haven't heard from God on any of that kind of stuff. I don't bank my money on what prophets say. The Bible says when it comes to pass, then we believe it. But one thing I know for sure, if there was no prophets, if this word of, is not coming down from heaven, there's one thing that the Bible is telling us, and it's right here in the story. We need to occupy till he comes. God is telling us that we need to live for Jesus every day of our lives. We need to put ourselves in a position to hear the voice of God. Now, he speaks in many different ways. He might speak to us audibly, but he might just move in our hearts and give us scriptures in our minds. There's many ways that God will get the truth to us. But I was thinking this, the, um, this this morning, actually, I was thinking about this virus, and I was thinking about how if a computer had a virus, your computer's not going to work right. And then you're going to have to get rid of that virus, reboot your system, and get everything back up and running. Well, you know, it seems to me that this virus is something like that in the world right now. God's people have been, have been playing too much in this world. God's not against us going on vacations and having a good time and enjoying our families. God's not against us going to restaurants and eating and all that. But when all of that takes first place, when God gets bumped out and this is priority, we don't even spend time much anymore even asking God, what would you have me to do? We go into the stores. We go places. I heard stories about some Christians working on the job that you, could, you couldn't tell if they was a Christian or not. They sound just like the worldly people. You know, the scriptures tell us in, in, in uh, Corinthians that we need to come out from among this world. We need to touch not the unclean thing. You know, like I said, God's not against us going fishing or hunting or any of these other things that we do. But when they take precedence, when they take first place, rather than serving God. You know, we can't have church right now. And man, I can't wait for that day when we can get back together and we can shake hands and hug one another and talk and see each other face to face. Some people don't see a need for the local church, but I'm a pastor and I do see the need. And boy, I think everybody can really recognize that right now. We need one another. And I'm gonna show you a couple things this morning. Let's go to the next one. Here in 2 Peter, it says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. He's given us everything we need. It's already here. He's given us all these great promises and gifts. Everything we need to live that godly life before this wicked world. We have received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. So right here, the scriptures are telling us we have everything we need because we know him. 
But I wonder about a lot of Christians sometimes because of some of the things that they're doing. I wonder how well do they know him? Do you understand what he's done for you on the cross? Have you given your life to him? Have you picked up your cross and carried it? Do you understand that you're here but a little while? It says in James in chapter 4 that we're like a vapor. We're here for a little while and then we die. We're all going to die of something and yet we get all stressed out when a disease comes. People are dying every day. I believe a person dies every so many minutes or seconds. It's people dying all the time. And do they know the Lord? That's the big question. There's a lot of people that are being struck down right now with this body. Do they know Jesus? Do they know for sure? In 1 John it says, Beloved, I write this, that you will know that you have eternal life. You see, we can rest assured that if we do die, by whatever means, we're going to heaven. God says in, uh, the, uh, Peter wrote, actually it's Paul, I'm sorry, Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians 2, Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has entered into the heart of the things God has prepared for those that love him. God's got great things waiting for us in heaven. And one day when we get there, we're going to say, man, what was all the fuss about on this earth? You see, we got to get our mind set on things above. we got to focus in on God. We got to give him time for worship every day. I made a, a promise to myself I will never get up off of, out of my bed and off my pillow without worshiping the Lord and getting my day started in Christ. And the days that I don't, those are the days that things don't seem to go just right. It's because I didn't put Christ first. You know, we got to think about, are we putting Jesus first? Are we putting him first in our lives? Let's look at something. Go to the next one. And it says, and continuing on these scriptures, that because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You know, these promises are designed so we can share in Jesus' divine nature. One day we're going to have a new body just like under his. But right now we can share in his divine nature in his divine nature, and then we can share it with the world. We can live in such a way that the people, people would want what you have. But when we blend in with the world, they don't even know. I remember being in high school, that was back in the 70s. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't remember seeing any Christian. I don't even know if there was a Christian in the school. We all were doing the things that we felt like doing and doing the bad things, but I didn't know. But now there are Christians in the high schools now. There are, there are ministries getting in there now. We've come a long way since I was in high school, showing and demonstrating that divine nature. You know, people say, why do we do what we do? It's because we want to be like Christ. We want to have his, his nature in our lives because our nature is still sinful. In these bodies, they, we're still going to die because there's a sinful nature to this body. And this body is, is corrupted in this world. But one day we're going to put on incorruption. And we're going to live with Christ forever and forever. That's a glorious thing. So here right here, the scriptures are telling us that this world is corrupt. And it's full of lust and human desires. And it's easy, even as a Christian, to get caught up in these human desires. To watch things that we shouldn't be watching. To do things that we shouldn't be doing. You know, the Lord tells us to come out from this world. Be separate, it says. Be different. We're chosen by God chosen to be a light to this world and especially in bad times that's when we should shine the brightest the darker the night the greater the light shines so let's go on and look at a couple of things that's out of these scriptures number one it says in that scripture from in that in peter it says god has given us everything we need for living a godly life everything he has provided for us on the cross you know, Jesus Christ died on that cross, and, and he gave us exceeding great promises, and he gave us great gifts. But we don't all have the same gifts. You know, not like Paul said, he's, Paul told us that we don't all do the same things. We're all different people. Let's look at the scripture, and you'll see that. Romans 12 says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. He's given us a, a measure of faith. 
We all have an equal measure of faith. And we need to use that faith. That's a gift that God has given us in order to be able to believe on great things. When we can say, I know it's all going to work out for the good. I know things are going to work out. People say, well, how do you know that? How can you tell that? I say, because I'm a Christian. And it's going to work out one way or the other. And so we have this faith that makes us rejoice in the midst of things that we shouldn't be rejoicing in. I don't rejoice over the virus, but I rejoice that God has not left us. He's still here with us. And I believe he's trying to get the virus out of the church and reboot the church like I was talking about with his computer. Get it back running in order the way that it, it should run. And this is something that God is doing right now. Go to the next one, please. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individual, individually members of one another. So the idea here is that we make up the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. The Holy Spirit is in us. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 that we will purchase with a great price the blood of Jesus Christ has washed us and it has purchased us. So we don't own our lives. You don't own anything. If God decides to take you home, it's not your will. It's his will that will be done. But right here it tells us that we all have different gifts. And God is trying to maneuver us and bring us into places to minister on this earth. You know, in the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote that God had given great gifts to the church, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, for the edifying of the saints, for the work of the ministry. I'm here this morning making this video, talking to whoever, that I'm trying to edify you, that you are very important in the body of Christ. God has chosen you. You're like the, you know, if, if somebody went to a tree, an apple tree, say, and there was a green apple and a red apple, they're going to pick the red apple because it's ripe and it's ready. And that's what God has done. He has chosen the right ones, those that are ready for ministry. And he's filling us up with great promises and great gifts so we can minister. And as I'm part of the fivefold ministry of the church, I'm a teacher and a pastor. I'm here to tell you that you are highly important. I'm here to tell you that you have gifts even if you don't know them. I know Christians, many Christians will say, I don't know what my gift is. Well, you need to just spend time with God. You just need to grow up in the Lord. You just need to come to a place inside yourself that you can start to understand why you are alive. Why are you here? What is, what is God calling you to? He knows the gifts that he's placed in you. He's given you a measure of faith. It's enough faith. You know, I've always looked at that measure of faith as, as being enough faith to reach heaven and pull down the fullness of faith. You know, what do you have needs need for in your life? What kind of needs do you have? Use that measure of faith. Touch heaven. Reach heaven with it. And God will begin to unlock those gifts that are inside of you. There's a lot of people that need your gift. They need your gift right now. You know, you might have a comforting gift. We're going to see the kind of gifts that the Bible talks about. But you could have the kind of gift that comforts and edifies and lifts up. And the kind of gift that can heal the sick and, and do great miracles and signs and wonders. But those gifts are down inside you. You need to stir them up. You need to stir these gifts up. Go to the next one, please. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. Now he says, if, if prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith. If service, in service. Or use it to service, to help someone. If teaching, in teaching. Or use it to teach. Use your life to be an instruction to people on how to live. In exhorting, in exhortation, to exhort, to lift up, to build up, don't tear down. It's easy to look at someone's faults and, and then condemn them. Why don't we start looking for each other's strengths and say, hey, you know, God loves you, God has given you gifts, and I see some of those gifts in you. And talk to them and tell them, look, look for the good in people. It's easy to find the bad, it's all over. But look for the good in people and, and use that. Let that be the center. If you do see them doing something bad, just say, hey, you know, God, God has given you great gifts to help you become a better person. And just use the, 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 the edification, the exhortation to lift people up. Then it says, in giving with generosity, leading with 
diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Cheerfulness will give someone hope. So why? Why are you smiling? Because I see hope in you. I see that God is doing something in your life. But some people can't see that, so they, they frown all the time. They stay focused on the negative. I'm just challenging that if you just spend some time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, in worshiping God, you'll start being transformed. Your mind will be renewed, like it says in Romans 12. Now, you won't be subject to this world, but you'll be subject to the kingdom of heaven. In Philippians, Paul writes that we are citizens of heaven. See, we're no longer citizens of this earth. We live and we know and God's going to provide and take care of us. And God is there with us and for us. But we are citizens of heaven. And we should be living like we are in heaven already. We should be thinking about those wonderful heavenly places that one day we're going to live. And then we can give some hope to people that don't see that. These people are lost. and There's so many that are lost and they're hurting and they're fearful. They don't know where they're going to go when they die. You know, I was a nursing home minister before Hurricane Katrina for five years. And we'd go into the rooms and talk to them. We'd ask people, do you know if you're going to go to heaven if you die? And so many would say, you can't know that. And I said, well, yes, you can. If you know Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with him, you will know, it says in first time, you will know that you have eternal life. You know, these are encouraging words. And then they wanted to know, and we would lead them to Jesus. And then when Hurricane Katrina hit, there were so many people that drowned. Many of them we knew had already known the Lord. They went right into heaven with a glorious thing. So right now, we see here in the Word of God, it's telling us that here's a, a bunch of gifts that God has given people. And there are so many others, too. You might have a, a gift to, to run the church or be, uh, do a person that can do finance and so forth. These are all gifts. Some people say, well, I just can't speak in front of people. Maybe you can just be a prayer warrior at home in your prayer closet. There's so many things that we can do. We need to get busy doing it. You know, you see your neighbor's grass needs to be cut. Maybe that's something you can do. Go over there and cut their grass for them. Maybe it's because right now they can't, they can't find somebody to come cut the grass. Who knows? Just simple, simple things like that. Still smiling when you go in the store. Be in there encouraging by the, by the expression on your face. You could be an encouragement. Go to the next one, please. And number two, it says in that first scripture, it says, the promises of God enables us to share his divine nature. See, this is another truth that we need to get down inside of us. The, the gifts and the calling, they, they ought to benefit us. The Bible says that he who has a vineyard is first partaker of that vineyard. And this is something that... You know, we need to understand that the gifts that are in us, we first use those gifts. As a teacher, I have taught myself. I have studied and read, and, and I, have, I have learned such great truths that are in the Word of God. So I first have to teach myself in order to teach others. And so whatever gift you got, you need to first minister to yourself with it. How can you be an encouragement to somebody in the world when you can't even encourage yourself? How can you build somebody up when you are not even building your own self up in your most holy faith, believing in the Lord? How can you lead someone to Christ and tell them that Christ can deliver them from the bondages of their lives, and yet you're still bound up on something? You see, all these things we ought to partake first and bring into ourselves so that we can have that divine nature, so that we can share that divine nature with others. You know, Christ came into this world, and he poured himself into his 12 disciples, and then he poured himself into 70, because he sent them out by twos, and then he was followed by hundreds that he poured himself into in teachings and different things. And so this is what he's telling us to do. He's telling us to pour ourselves out into somebody's life. And we need to, we need to have the joy of the Lord. That's our strength. We need to have faith, not fear. We need to rise up and instead of being drugged down. We need to rise up and give people hope. We need to give ourselves hope. We need to build ourselves up first and then go out into the world and build somebody out. Challenge yourself today to go find one person, one person, and go lift them up. Do you know anybody who's down and nervous and worried? 
Just go find one person and pour yourself into them. So the next scripture here, in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, the amen is also spoken through him by us for God's glory. In other words, what's being said here is the promises of God are yes and amen. In other words, God's not saying, oh, I don't know if you deserve my promises. See how you messed up over here? God already knows we mess up. He's already made a plan for our messing up. You know, in the Old Covenant, God had a day of atonement that they would sacrifice, and the high priest would go in. He would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood, the blood of a goat and of a bull, and with incense to fill up the, the holy place. And he would make atonement, and the blood would cover, would cover them for another year. But now, because of Jesus Christ, who's went into the Holy of Holies of Heaven with his own blood, that our sins aren't covered any longer. They are totally forgiven. The Bible says our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Did you know that you could go north and then you'll start going south and then you'll start going north? But if you go west, you will never go east. You will continue to go west all the way around the planet. So God has separated our sins just like that. East and west never meet. If you go east, you'll continue to go east. If you go west, continue to go west. East and west do not meet. Your sins will not be remembered against you ever again. And so we come to the Lord, it says in 1 John chapter 1, that we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So know this, that we all mess up. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I can't point my finger at you and tell you that your sin's worse than mine. My flesh is always doing stupid things. I've gotten stronger and better, but I still mess up. That's why God's going to give me give you also a new body like unto the Lord that doesn't, doesn't ever mess up. We're going to be just like Christ in heaven. Never ever again to sin. But right now we have to deal with these things. We have to deal with our flesh. We have to subdue it and bring it down. And the promises of God which are yes and amen have promised us, have promised us that these things will happen. Let me go to another scripture and show you something. Here in 2 Corinthians 7, it says, Therefore, dear friends, since we have such promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, completing our sanctification in the fear of God. So Paul's telling us that, let me, let me just say it this way, you can't purge yourself, but you can want to be purged. Do you know where your weaknesses are? I think everybody does. I know what I'm capable of doing. I know how this flesh can act, and all I could ever hope for is to say, God, please help me. God, deliver me from this. If you're going to try to deliver yourself, it's not going to happen. The Bible tells us you just don't have the strength to deliver yourself. We need a Savior. We need Jesus Christ. I need him every day of my life. Not a day will go by that I will not worship him and tell him how wonderful he is. And I say to him, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help me, O oh Lord. Help me to overcome these, these areas of my life that does not bring you glory. I want my life to bring you glory. So as we close out this morning, I want us to just pray together. Why don't you just bow your head right where you are? And let's, let's just talk to God. Let's just tell him, Lord... We need you. We need your help, not just because there's a coronavirus, but every day, no matter what. I know, Lord, that you, you have called us to occupy. You called us to, to do business, to do the kind of heavenly business on this earth. And I know, Lord, that I have weaknesses in my life. I have messed up. I have maybe hurt some people. I have said things that I should not have said. And Father, I just ask right now that you forgive me. And Lord, that if I got anybody in my heart, I just pray that you help me to forgive them and release them from my heart. And we just ask this right now in your wonderful name, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. So as we close out this morning, let us, let us understand. Let us just understand that God is for you. He's not against you. 
God already knows all your weaknesses. Don't think that you've just caught God off guard. He already knows. And the Bible said he's already at work. He's at work in you. And he will complete it unto the day of the Lord. So right now we just give God the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody be safe and be blessed in Jesus' name.